Что такое? Фиг, сколько ты заплатила. И... Dreary night of November. Welcome, Franken readers, to Sundays with Frankenstein. I will revenge my injuries. If I cannot inspire love, I will cause fear and chiefly towards you, my arch enemy, because my creator do I swear inextinguishable hatred. Have a care, I will work at your destruction, nor finish until I desolate your heart, so that you curse the hour of your birth. Franken readers, I hope you are not cursing the hour of your birth or cursing anyone else's. This is episode 10 of Sundays with Frankenstein. We will be covering volume two, chapter nine, and volume three, chapter one of the 1818 edition today. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach in Philadelphia, and joining me today is actor and collector Dan Hodge. Hey, Ed, how are you? I'm great, Dan. I haven't seen you since our Frankenfilms program, right? Yeah, I know. It's been a little bit. Uh, it's been too I've, long. Yeah, it's been far too long. It feels so good to be back. It's nice to see you. It's nice to... I've been loving, like, it's been kind of surprising how much I've been loving reading the book again. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I'm just, it's so richly satisfying in a way that I frankly didn't remember from when I was young. So this yeah. has been a boon to me. Yeah. Are you, are you, are you shorn here? Or I am shorn. Yes. Oh yes, you are. So yes, I, I got not only my hair cut, but all of my hair is cut. Yes. There you go. <laughs> no, not me. I'm, you know, and the hairs get long again and you know, I'm just, yeah, this is going for it. Well, you know, I've been, I was going for it before the, the <laughs> pandemic. So, you know, it's just ongoing, but yeah, no, we had, uh, we had Anastasia here like three weeks in a row um, to like regularly schedule that she jumped on for another. Um, so, uh, and then we'll have you on again in just a couple of weeks. So yeah. we'll, you know, we'll get to do that with everyone. Uh, are, are you drinking a special vintage today? Um, you know, interestingly enough, uh, it's, it's a wine that I've discovered out here and it's, it feels somehow appropriate to, uh, to our studies, it's called Folly of the Beast. Ooh, and with the and 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 very uh, uh, like a Moby Dick theme there. Yeah, very nautical. Nautical. Yes, I like that. So, very good. Well, I I am I'm I'm so happy with this drink today because it's a gin drink. I also I and I really love gin. And the cocktail today is called the Bride of Frankenstein, and it includes this White Mountain Gin from Tamworth. Um, which is which is really delicious. Uh, White Mountain Gin combines traditional gin botanicals with a blend of Centennial, Citra, 
and Amarillo hops for notes of citrus and pine. Um, I'm a gin lover, so it, and and this is a really tasty one, just even by itself. Um, but this drink itself, and Brianna, our chat Igor, will put the recipe in our chat. We'll also post it on our website. It is. Um, it's the gin with fresh lemonade. I made myself some fresh lemonade this morning, squeeze lemons and sugar and water, and uh, a little bit of um, thyme simple syrup. And I actually made my own and it's not that hard. Uh, I made it with, I made a honey sugar syrup and added thyme to it. That's the, you know, it's, it's a little darker with the honey. Uh, and if you've never made your own simple syrup, it's very easy. It's equal parts sugar and water. You just heat it up until the sugar dissolves. Then you let it cool. Then you put it in the refrigerator. I did half, half sugar and half honey. Ooh, and the honey I use was this death honey. Uh, I thought it was appropriate for the show. It is from the, oh, I forgot to bring the jar up. It is from the Philadelphia Bee Company, I think they're called. And it's called Doom Bloom because this honey comes from trees well 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 it here, here's how it is the the spotted lantern fly attacks these trees and then the bees come and they're able to get to the to the nectar or, or whatever the sap in the tree themselves and then they take that back and make honey out of it so so the honey itself is like from the the insect the spotted lantern fly because of that insect that's killing all the trees so it's they call it doom bloom so um uh, 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 and that's the honey I used. And then you just soak thyme in it. And then we just cut some sprigs of thyme from our from our herb garden, and uh, and you steep it in the in the uh, the sugar honey syrup. And I got a little, I got some little dried flowers with a little garnish. So so I, I in my in my uh, Ernest Stegeger, uh voice or my attempt at it, I give you the bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> Cheers. Ah, wow, that is good. Um, refreshing. Um, it's and it's and it's very much, you know, a spring summer drink, which we are heading towards soon. So thank you, Tamworth Distilling and Art in the Age for coming up with this very yummy concoction. You can buy White Mountain Gin at Art in the Age in Philadelphia, and you could donate to the Rosenbach on their website. When you click on their site for this special Sundays with Frankenstein White Mountain Gin, there's a little button there that allows you to donate to the Rosenbach as well, which is very nice. But, but, but we're not just drinking here today. We are talking about Frankenstein. And what we do every week is dissect, anatomize, dismember, and bring back to life this book by Mary Shelley, chapter by chapter, page by page, word by word, as we create our very own conversational annotation of the novel. And in doing this, we at the Rosenbach also ask you to support us, which you can do by donation. And if you're not already a member, please join. The basic membership of the Rosenbach is called the Mary Shelley level. So I'll have more to say that about this at our mid-break. I want to remind people watching live on Zoom that when you're in the chat, make sure you set your chat to panelists and attendees so everyone can see your chat. The default is just panelists, so people sometimes do that. And and just set it that way. And if you have a question on, and you're watching live on Zoom, you can put it in the Q&A box if you have a question for Dan and I. There's one in there already waiting for us to answer later. So uh, add the questions and, and I'll get to the questions as they, as they, as they, as they arise within the, in, within the chapters as we go through them. So uh, ready, Dan? Yeah, let's go for it. Good, all right, let me get another sip first because this is good. All righty. Um, on with the show. Uh, last week, we the uh, we did the chapters where the creature finished his story, um, so, uh, all about the Delacys and Safi, and then he tries to join them, and you know, and then is it's disastrous. And then he travels to Geneva. He shot. Um, he murders William Frankenstein. He plants the uh, locket on Justine, who is then killed because of that. And then it ends, the chapter ends with him asking Victor to create him a mate. Um, and that is where we are at today. Um, he uh, finished speaking um, and fixed his looks upon me in expectation of a reply. Uh, and it's the being finished speaking. And I like that. There are some people who I think it's uh, in the in the Oxford uh, the new Oxford edition edited by Nick Groom in his in his intro. 
he, he writes it and talks about as we all do and as we have on the show, uh, what do you call the creature? And Nick Room, uh, the, the scholar says, we should call him being. Uh, he's the being um, because it's used so often and it is used often as a, as a term in here. Um, and this is Victor using it. Victor is calling him the being. Uh, the being finished speaking, but I was bewildered, perplexed, and unable to arrange my idea sufficiently to understand the full extent of his proposition. Like, the, uh, uh, what? <laughs> uh, and, and the creature says, uh, you must create a female for me with whom I can live in the interchange of those sympathies necessary for my being. Uh, and then I demand it of you as a right. Um, this is what he, you know, says he should have. Um, he is, you know, Victor's bewildered by this, um, but the, um, uh, that he would ask this at first, but uh, this seems reasonable. Does it seem reasonable then? <laughs> I actually had a really, um, I had a reaction to this section of the book that I did not anticipate actually. Um, you know, because of course, literarily speaking, you want to go, yeah, this is completely reasonable. And for the first time as I'm reading this, I'm going, how dare he? <laughs> like the presumption of it mm -hmm. and to himself insist upon bringing a life into this world that has no say in its own creation. The presumption that this being would be content living alongside him in exile, mm -hmm. hated by all humanity besides, you know, this, this creature who is demanding that she be made. Um, yeah, I was really surprised at, at how it struck me. Is and it like father, like son? <laughs> I think a bit. And I, maybe it's part of this kind of like massive cultural conversation that we've all been having as we settle into the 21st century. But like the notions of outsidership and the, the, and the even the word slavery is invoked. And like the, the notion of... Uh, the, the presumption that comes with the patriarchy and you know male dominance it's a really deeply unsettling thing the more I, time i spend with it yeah. So yeah that's that's where i'm coming into it so you say reasonable and i'm like boy that's the crackerjack question right out the front because it doesn't feel reasonable to me no all. it isn't and, and and it's fascinating it's another link between the creature and and victor you know, another way that they are just doppelgangers of each other yeah. um dual sides and, of the same coin yeah and 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 behave in the same way um absolutely uh and presumption like you said that's the obviously the first play of frankenstein is called presumption alluding to or 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 kind of alluding to victor and his creating like he's the one that's that's you know being presumptive but mm -hmm. it's the, the creature does as well and and it's interesting it's just as you know victor um you know, thought that his creature would be beautiful and love him and all these things would arise from it, you know, his, you know, uh, the creature thinks the same, of course, you would assume the creature wouldn't reject his, you know, his being like uh, uh, his, uh, his mate, like, like right. Victor did, but it does very much subject the, the female creation is only there to serve the male creation. Which is, you know, it's, it's the same mistake that Victor made in the sense that like, yeah, you, you lack the foresight that whatever you bring into this world is going to have a will of its own, desires of its own, dreams of its own, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, that's the thing that I've really been grappling with as I've, as I've encountered this part of the book. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Victor, Victor admits he's at first, you know, that he says the latter part of his tale, of him telling the, the story of his travels and, and what he went through, um, uh, had kindled a new in me the anger I meaning the latter part when he started talking about murdering but that had you know that but when he was talking about his peaceful life among the cottagers it was obviously different so victor does automatically like the reader um uh feel for uh this creature but then it goes away and then his first reaction is i do refuse it uh and no torture shall ever exhort to consent from me well, you know, a few paragraphs later, we find out that that's not true because he doesn't torture him and he consents. But um, you may render me the most miserable of men, uh, but you shall never make me base in my own eyes. Shall I create another like yourself whose joint wickedness might desolate the world? Be gone. I have answered you. You may torture me, but I will never consent. So um, just 
you know, line of the sand, the wall, not never going to happen. You shall not pass. Um, Victor <laughs> is all, you know, like, absolutely not. Um, and the, uh, uh, and the creature just, you know, has to uh, convince him. Um, the creature has to, you know, reason with him. Um, and, uh, um, and that's what he does. He says, instead of threatening, I'm content to reason with you. Um, and then he gives all these, you know, well, he gives good reasons why he should have someone else in his life. He should have a family or he should have a mate. He should have companionship. Um, you're right that he doesn't consider the, you know, the rights, uh, or, or the choices of the, of the, uh, of whoever will be his mate, but his reasons are he is malicious because I am miserable. Um, you, my creator would tear me to pieces Tell me why I should pity man more than he pities me. Um, shall I respect man when he condemns me? Let him live. Let him live with me in the interchange of kindness. And instead of energy, uh, injury, I would bestow every benefit upon him with, <clears throat> excuse me, with tears of gratitude at his acceptance. This sounds like this is like the. It sounds like the hath not a Jew eyes speech from from Merchant of Venice. You know, like if you, if a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? revenge of a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why revenge? Like the creature saying, hey, if this is the way people act, you know, uh, um, I, sh I should be treated the same. And just like Shylock, it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. <laughs> yeah. And he's not going to desolate your heart. And he's not going to cut out your heart. He's going to desolate your heart. So, yeah. you know, which, which I love the threat that he, th and that's the next threat that he makes. Um, you know, I will desolate your heart if you don't do this um that phrase just that the, that's the, the the whole the longer quote i read earlier to start today but you know that always stops me in my tracks until i desolate your heart so because how often do you use desolate as a verb first of all so we use desolation a lot but rarely you know desolate as a heart as a verb um, and i love that he, he says i'm not going to threaten you i'm going to reason with you and then threatens him <laughs> yeah and then i'll threaten you at the end and i will you know Desolate it's, your heart and curse the hour of your birth, as if like that is the, you know, um, you know, as that's as that's worse. Like the worst thing. Like he he finishes it with, and curse the hour of your birth, um, which is interesting because he's just finished reading Paradise Lost, right? So, the, one of the most important things is is is, is that is for the created beings to worship their god and love their god and so i mean so if that's that's the worst thing that could happen is the created being curses the god um or the creator which is what he's threatening him with um he um but he calms himself down after that threat he says he calmed himself and proceeded um and then he you know uh, what I ask is reasonable and moderate. I demand another creature of my sex, but as hideous as myself. Um, again, like, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the kind of, you know, presumption on his part to say, you know, make her, but make her ugly like me. Well, why don't you make her beautiful? And, you know, but then of course she won't love him because he recognizes that it's his appearance that is his, uh, that drives people to hate him. Um, and then he promises that this this great promise for their future life. Um, and uh, I would say if anybody ever like proposes this as a good way to go like be off, go off and live with them, say no right away. Uh, it is true we shall be monsters cut off from all the world, but on that account, we shall be more attached to one another. Our lives will not be happy, but they will be harmless and free from the misery I now feel. Oh, my creator, make me happy. Let me feel gratitude towards you for one benefit. Let me see that I excite the sympathy of some existing thing. Do not deny me my request. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's this pleading with his creator to make him a mate. And, and we have this similar thing going on in Paradise Lost where Adam wants a mate, but the creature doesn't do it in humility. The creature does it more like Satan in like Lucifer in Paradise Lost, like demanding it and it is his right and he has to have it. Um, and that's that mixing, I think, of those characters in him. 
for this in this uh, in, in the way he reads Paradise Lost. Um, they're going to go to South America. Of course, they'll be fine, right? Um, uh, well, Victor first, you know, Victor starts again thinking about it. I thought of the possible consequences of consenting. Um, and then he even notices that, he, that his tail proved him to be a creature of fine sensations. And don't I owe him this, um, that, you know, to, to do this. And the creature piles, a creature, you know, sees his change like okay i'm making progress you can see it in his expression and then he and then he comes up with this plan i will go to the vast wilds of south america um i'm sure the south americans people living there aren't going to appreciate this but but it's the idea that i'll go to a remote place where i won't actually see any people um and uh, and he doesn't, you know, he's a he's a vegetarian. I don't destroy the lamb and kid my and and the kid to glut my appetite. He eats acorns and berries. He's you know, this is a, he's like Percy Shelley. Uh, Percy Shelley was not only a vegetarian, but he had these. He would just he would eat like bread, and you know, and sugar. Um, uh, and then he stopped eating sugar because it's connection to the plantate, you know, to the plantations and the slave trade. And so he would eat bread <laughs> and like, I mean, and just practically starving himself all the time uh, and, and very unhealthy as a result of it. Um, but uh, he was not a healthy vegetarian. He was a, you're like, uh, I'm not gonna eat meat and I'm barely gonna eat anything else. Um, so, um, so this is his plan. Um, how can you who um, oh, that, that, that Victor responds, but the creature at least has a plan, right? And and it's like a DeLacy plan, isn't it? I mean, it's a bit like that. I think the thing that strikes me about this as I read it, the thing that I, I almost actually found funny is um, as soon as he, it's like he hadn't counted on it. And as soon as Victor like shows a bit of remorse, he's like, uh, 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 and just like makes this thing, like it's not really a plan as much as like we're gonna do this it's it's fine we don't eat, we don't eat what people eat we'll live on the the you know uh it makes me think of um lenny and george and of mice and men you know we're gonna live off the fat of the land yeah yeah i hadn't thought of that that's a good that's a good response but, but well very, uh, not for this novel but maybe for another kind of creature <laughs> right but it's very there's something kind of deliciously naive about it um which is something I feel like we often overlook with a creature because, or with the being, because his language is so sophisticated, but because his understanding comes from Paradise Lost and from the bits and pieces that he's gathered from the DeLacy, like the, I love the DeLacy section of the book. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he, to a degree, naively believes after spying on them for so long that he can go and join their family. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the kind of childlike nature of this, creature that is fully grown, educated, able to speak and comport himself, but has no idea what reality is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, but he is rewarded in that a little bit in that, um, well, he's right in a bit in that the father, the blind father completely accepts him. Absolutely. Um, so um, the, that, that he's kind of right if he can convince someone ahead of time that he's not dangerous after the show ended last week like we were all i was talking my my uh my family and and my, my kids were like oh he should have done this and why did he do this and what do you think was going to happen when he went right in and he should have revealed himself slowly or he should have you know left them a note saying i've been chopping your firewood for you i'm the you know i'm that person and i'm ugly Please don't, you know, please don't hold it against me. But it was a circumstantial thing. And I, and I think that was part of the tragedy in that situation is that his plan was correct, that he goes in and I'll approach the blind, approach the blind father first and he accepts him and they just come home too soon. You know, like he's not expecting them to rush it, to come in yeah. right at that moment. And then he's caught. Yeah. Um, so, um, but you can go down all those what if scenarios and, um, <laughs> Uh, and who knows? Um, but but that's the that's his ideal of a life. is It's not it's not just being with someone, but being with that person or group somewhere else outside of. Um, he he believes he needs it because of his appearance, and people will you know um, 
uh, reject him, but a, um, uh, but it's also what he has seen and it's what he knows that the Lacy's are themselves outcasts uh, and live, you know, virtually, you know, away from other people. Unlike Victor who has people to live with and he keeps living alone on purpose. Running away from them. Yes. Um, Victor, um, Victor says, uh, how can you who long for the love and sympathy for man persevere in this exile. So he kind of picks up on what we're talking about here. Um, you will return and again, seek their kindness and you will meet with their detestation. Your passions, your evil passions will be renewed. You will have, you will then have a companion to aid you in the task of destruction. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's, that's not a bad point. Um, <laughs> that now point. there's going to be two of you and, um, and you've already murdered. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, how much do you, tr how much can Victor trust the creature when the creature gets angry, he murders. Um, uh, the creature swears. Oh, when he swears to, he says, I swear to you by the earth which I inhabit and by you that made me. Um, uh, I found it interesting. And later on, they'll be, they'll, he'll, he'll do this again. Um, but to, to swear by the earth, and his creator, um, uh, which is uh, um, on the one on the one hand, he's like this romantic poet who's placing the earth and the natural world and the capital N nature. That's what you pray to, and that happens all through this novel. Like Victor does it, you know, the creature does it. Um, uh, people don't pray to God in this novel, but the creature also does to his creator, which, again, I think is something he has learned from Paradise Lost. Um, that, you know, I swear to you, or swearing and praying and, and you know, I, I'm, I'm putting those together there. Um, and by you that made me, um, that I will, you know, that I won't hurt anybody. And my evil passions will have fled for I shall meet with sympathy. My life will flow quietly away. And in my dying moments, I shall not curse my maker. I mean, this scenario too that you described, like he's being presumptuous, she'll love him. This is what happens in the in the film Bride of Frankenstein. Yes, um, yeah, absolutely. She rejects him outright, and and actually prefers um, Colin Clive. Yeah, you know, she 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 wants she wants you know her creator, and mm -hmm. and rejects the creature at one look, and um, uh, and it's. And if you want to go even further, there's uh, you know, we talk in in our Franken films thing. We talked briefly about. Um, a really wonderful representation of the creature in in, uh, in pop culture is is in uh, Penny Dreadful. Yeah, and just exactly that thing happens where he demands a mate. Rory Kinnear shows up and does that thing, and Victor creates this woman and falls in love with her. She's beautiful, and I mean, mm -hmm. deems her perhaps even too beautiful for yeah for the, for the thing that he's created. And it's it becomes fabulously complicated. It's a really great imagining extrapolation of this sort of thing and speaks to that point that you're creating and you know you cannot assume that this being this other being will also you know uh, will, should also be able to choose and yeah. may not choose you so and she does and i believe in penny dreadful she chooses victor for a while and then chooses elsewhere <laughs> yeah so this is dorian right yeah so yeah. um uh, and then, well, you know, she's got a great story. So, oh, that wonderful, wonderful English yeah. actress as well. Yeah. Like Billy Piper, right? Billy yeah. Piper. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dangerous. Rose, she's Rose, and then Doctor Who. So, yeah, she's exquisite. Such a fine performer. Um, the uh, Victor um, says his words had a strange effect upon me. I compassionated him, and again, there's another one that we don't use as a verb. Oh. Um, uh, I compassionated him. I, I felt compassion for him. Uh, when I looked upon him, when I saw the filthy, but, but he says, when I looked upon him, when I saw the filthy mass that moved and talked, well, it happened to your compassion, Victor. Um, my heart sickened and my feelings were altered to those of horror and hatred. Um, he's, you know, he, this is, I, I, it, it's it's odd because I don't think it's that superficial. I, I don't think it's it's you know oh you're ugly I'm you know and it's it's a deeper thing that he's seeing in him. This kind of you know what he represents or what his form represents. I think I mean because the filthy mass he sees, um, 
is the filthy workshop of creation that he has originally put together. I mean, this represents everything that has gone wrong um, with his great plan. Um, I mean, he's still just as wrong for observing this, right, and making this judgment. But um, but it's not just it's not just because he's ugly. Um, it is, you know, it's what it that is. ugliness represents. I think yeah. as much as anything else, it's it's his responsibility to this creature as well. Like not only is this it's this lump of deformity and sorrow, um, misery, and Victor is directly responsible for those things. Yeah. And I think he's too narcissistic to be able to handle it. So he puts all of that frustration, anger, hatred back onto the creature rather than dealing with it. Yeah. But it also leads him. And then at the end of that little paragraph, he says, I had no right to withhold from him the small yeah. portion of happiness, which was yet in my power to bestow. Um, yeah. Like there's some benevolent, you know, overseer, you know, creator. <laughs> um, uh so it's he's being convinced um he's got he's feels compassion and then he's re and then he feels the revulsion and then he's saying okay maybe i i should grant you this um and um uh and then he questions the creature and the creature says what um uh uh, the creature kind of try, tries to convince him more. If I have no ties and no affections, hatred and vice must be my portion. The love of another will destroy the cause of my crimes. And then this spectacular line a sentence later, my vices are the children of a forced solitude that I abhor. Uh, and my virtues will necessarily arise when I live in communion with an equal. I mean, but I, my vices are the children of a forced solitude that I abhor. Um, talk about a, a, a line that, that not only says a lot about how the creature feels and why he's gone wrong, and then I think we can agree with him, but also it's like he's the child of the forced solitude of Victor that has gone wrong, right? Like it becomes a vice, a monster created because Victor has been alone and then left him alone. Um, there's all this resonance in that line, I think. So, um, and yeah, it's, yeah, it, it, the, it, it also harkens the whole educational um, premise of this novel too, right? Like of, of this is, um, uh, if he is going to be left alone and forced to be alone and rejected by people uh, and alone, then that will make him bad. I mean, this is the the, the argument that that really you know really starts to jet to to drive a lot of nineteenth century in, in in crime and punishment and up till today, um, and and to think that the um, solution for a lot of you know people in the 19th century were beginning to think and in philadelphia as well mm. to put people in solitude uh and then they would be able to reform um, the state penitentiary was was all about isolation and of course now we know that or you know studies have shown and and you know when you look at the the prison system like solitary confinement is considered torture i mean yeah. you know I, I worked with some prisoners doing some shakespeare stuff and for them there was one guy went into the hole for I think nine months and it was hellish you know he was playing Duncan in a Macbeth that I was directing and he went into the hole six days before performances oh. and he didn't come out again until I and my partner Trevor Drake uh who I was working with on that until we came back again the next year to start workshops again oh my god and it was I mean, God bless him. I mean, it was really something to see it. And he talked about it. He went mad for a little while and then he came back and came hmm. like a sheaf of poetry, bless the guy. Hmm. It's, solitude is, is in some ways the greatest punishment you can inflict upon someone to remove them from their fellow beings. Yeah. And think that it's used as a punishment in his case, I'm sure, but it's even used as a rehabilitation method in the 19th century, which is absolutely crazy. 
um, uh, because it will drive you crazy. Uh, and people recognize it for what it was. I mean, Dickens wrote about this after he visited Charles Dickens, after he visited Easter State Penitentiary, and thought like, these people are going to go crazy. Well, of course they will. Uh, if they have to spend, you know, years and years alone and never see anybody, uh, they even put hoods on them when they have to take them out of their of their cells. Um, but I, it's it's the idea that it's your you're it's the idea that you're not alone because you're actually able to commune with your God um, because you're alone and um, uh, 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 and that and that's an interesting thing for this novel because. Here, the creature literally gets to face his God, his creator, the one who gave him life uh, in more than just a natural. He's more than a father. He is a creator. Um, he generated him from something that was not alive. Um, and uh, and he gets to, to face him here, but it's his isolation. And then the whole other side, the whole other part of that is that it's the, you know, if, if, you know, if you're rejected, you will, of course, turn bad. Um, it's the social argument for, you know, how you treat people is how they're going to turn out. Um, and, uh, and the creature says that if I feel the affections of a sensitive being and become linked to the chain of existence and events from which I am now excluded, um, that, that, you know, he'll be better. I, 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 he's right. <laughs> I mean, that's, what, that's what we do. Um, we, you know, you, you connect people to others. Um, you raise your children that way. Um, you, 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 form your, you form society that way, that if we are all connected in, in this chain of existence and events, then you will, you know, feel the effect, you will feel affection for each other. So that doesn't completely work either, obviously, but, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's better than, better than not uh, having it. Um, the, uh, 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 the creature uh, is this Victor next? Yeah, it's Victor thinking. Um, oh, it's Victor thinking. He's he's a being possessing faculties it would be vain to cope with. Um, you know, and and his physical things he mentions before that. Um, the uh, I concluded that the justice due both to him and my fellow creatures demanded of me that I should comply with his request. That's interesting that he that it's I, all right. I concluded the justice after just after he said I can't fight him. Well, is it justice or is it that, you know, the creature is, you know, you can't defeat this creature. Um, uh, it's both clearly with Victor. And then he says, I consent, um, but you have to quit Europe forever. Just Europe. Okay. Just Europe. Only yeah. Europe. It's crazy <laughs> to say Geneva. You can't be anywhere near Geneva. Yeah. Um, now he makes him quit Europe where all the civilized people are and the rest of the world. Well, you know, the heck with that. Um, they're the rest of the world. Um, and every other place. Oh, well, he says, no, I'm sorry. And every other place in the neighborhood of man. So it's, you know, not only, not only Europe where we are here, but you have to go into a remote place where there's no people. So, um, uh, and the creature swears and again, and again, by the sun and by the blue sky of heaven I and mean, his, his swearing happens to, uh, to Nate. This is the higher authority. Um, that, that you swear by, um, uh, that if you grant, uh, you shall never behold me again. Uh, and then he says, depart to your home and commence your, then he orders them, right? Depart to your home and commence your labors. I shall watch their progress with unutterable anxiety and fear not, but that when you are ready, I shall appear. Um, the, uh, I wonder, can he, like, is it, well, can he, I mean, he, he swears to nature, and I guess he could swear to Victor, right? But, yeah. you know, but that's it. Um, or I guess I just already talked about that. But I, I, what's the sense that, I guess it, the bigger picture is, can he fathom another God? Because he doesn't. I, he reads about another God in Paradise Lost, but he never seems to say that, he never seems to acknowledge that he can fathom that, that, that another God exists besides his own creator. I mean, I think there's a degree to which I love I love this vow particularly because not only does he swear by the sun and by the sky, but as long as they both exist, he will be he will hold that oath. And that to me is the thing that gets it. Like if you swear swear by God, you're basically swearing by either your or really you're depending on somebody else's belief in that God. Mm -hmm. And 
the creature swears by verifiable things, mm. which I think is really something because right. I think he's got a better grasp on some of it than Victor does, certainly. And at reading Paradise Lost and accepting it as an extremely poetic but work of fiction, you know, I think the creature's got a really great grasp of what is real and what isn't because he is the living manifestation of it. <laughs> you know, he can put his hands on his God. So he gets to say, you know, Victor's a believer in science. I swear by this thing that I will, I will hold my faith as long as this thing exists. And he happens to choose things that are unlikely to topple, shall we say. Yeah. But but more than that, because you know it's it's literally the year. I mean, I guess that's wood right there, right? But this is like this is completely natural environment, growing organic material. Yes, he is wearing to. Um, he leaves, and the um, the comment that Victor makes or watching him leave, I always find interesting because this will happen again. Um, saying this, he suddenly quitted me, fearful perhaps of my change, any change in my sentence. Well, I don't think he's afraid of anything you're gonna say or think, Victor. Um, I saw him descend the mountain with greater speed than the flight of an eagle and quickly lost among the undulations of the sea of ice. Um, that is the first time in the novel the creature will be described as departing and is lost among, you know, the kind of natural setting. Um, the, uh, and it'll happen two more times in the book. Um, I forget the, where the second time is. It might even be the next. Yeah, it's, it's the uh, next week. It's one of the chapters from next week, the second chapter. He's lost in the waves in this boat. And then at, as, and, it, and it echoes the last line of the novel that he's, you know, um, um, what is it again? Uh, lost among the... Yeah, I'm finding it right now. Spoiler, um, lost lost in darkness and distance. But it, it, so that, that, that line kind of echoes throughout the novel that, you know, the creature is, as he departs, he's lost in, in distance. And um, I find that interesting. So and it's a nice little connection with Paradise Lost too. But I don't. I certainly don't think that's a completely intentional, you know, thing from the author. But it winds up being an image that this is how this this keep this happens three times. Twice for Victor, where he sees the creature just kind of become lost within the natural world, you know, as he departs, and uh, and then once for the reader at the or that's actually for Walton at the end. So, um. Victor, uh, then just like his creature, oh, stars and clouds and winds, um, that that's who he's, you know, you know, praying to, uh, and, and, and for him, it's, ye are all about to mock me if ye really, and he's like laying it on, like, this is a prayer with the yees, right? Um, if ye really pity me, crush sensation and memory, let me become as naught, but if not, depart, leave me in darkness. I mean, this is a natural world that has, you know, um, that itself has consciousness that he's, you know, crying out to. Um, and nature, and it's no consolation to him. Uh, he's not, it's like Victor's a bad romantic poet um, <laughs> because he's supposed to look at those stars and, uh, and, and wind and sky and clouds and, and winds and be inspired by it but instead you know he's you know afraid that they're just going to crush him so um or no he says if you pity me crush sensation and memory which is worse and that'll come in later when we hit the wordsworth tintern abbey because that poem itself by a romantic poet is about this experience of nature and then saving it in your memory and having it for a later time to go back and find solace in, even when you're not out in that place, you still have it because you have the memory. And Victor is literally telling the, the, the natural world to crush his memory, uh, crush his sensation. Uh, and they are the things that the that Mary Shelley's husband and other romantic poets are supposed to be, you know, uh, uh, doing with nature. That's, that's their purpose as a poet is to go out and commune with nature. Um, so 
I, another one of those for me that it, it's just the smallest thing that that just has resonance that it is her her critical of the you know the poetic endeavor that so many people she knows and also admires uh, are on um and and how that kind of thing can also be wrong as much as it can inspire it can lead to a selfishness that uh, that is destructive um and it continues that every blast of wind as it were a dull ugly siroc on its way to consume me um and uh and then we finish this and then he's back to the and he goes back to the family and and then we get a little dante reference in the last paragraph of this chapter um this is a record time we're finishing a chapter and it's like a quarter minute to the first hour um <laughs> We might finish early today. Who knows? Um, uh, we'll have to talk more. Uh, <laughs> the uh, we can finish like, every, what? every week. I'm just like so up against it, and I say that now, and I'm certain it's gonna. We're gonna like the second hour is gonna like go roll around. I'll be like, oh, I gotta fit a few more things in. Um, <laughs> It'll come together. Yeah. The uh, promise I made to the demon weighed upon my mind like Dante's iron cowl on the heads of the hellish hypocrites. Um, do you know this reference? I don't actually. Okay, this I, is. I, I know it's in the Inferno, but I don't know which which. State. This is in Dante's Inferno, and I have a picture. Uh, where's the picture I have of that? Here it is. Um, this is a. Uh, Dore, a Gustave Dore illustration mm. of Dante and Virgil here looking Dante and Virgil looking at these monks in their in their you know hoods and their, their cows here and they're they're they have to pace around you know forever obviously they're in hell and they are in the um Oh, I forget what circle. It's like a late circle. It's like, you know, it's like the ninth circle. I mean, they're they're really deep, um, uh, these hypocrites. Um, and the, the monks are punished by wearing robes and a cow that are they're burnished like gold on the outside, but inside is lined with lead. So mm -hmm. they are, so it is just horribly heavy all the time. And they are hypocrites. Um, uh, they they were pretending to do God's work. Um, when they were alive, preaching about God and how we should do this, but they were secretly corrupt and misusing the offices of the church, um, you know, for their own greed, their own power. Uh, and that's why they're hypocrites. So the question here is, is Victor, um, I put to you, Dan, is Victor recognizing himself as a hypocrite? And in what way is he a hypocrite? Man, that's an enormous question. Um, I, I, the, the, the short answer for me or the, or, or the nugget that I can answer immediately is that first part. Um, I think just given the way that it lands and the way that it sits, I do think he is acknowledging his own hypocrisy. Um, but his hypocrisy on what level or in what regard, I think is a far stickier thing to try to unpack. Um, which is, which is a really fancy way of saying, I don't exactly know. <laughs> he's constantly talking about his misery and how he's done something wrong and he right. is suffering for it. He never should have done this. Um, but that isn't the same thing as acknowledging that I have, you know, you know, practiced not what I preached, um, mm -hmm. that I have done something that goes again. Well, well, it, it is, it is that he has done something. Maybe that's the key that it, what he did in creating the creature what it really did was it went against what his goal was and what he should have been doing was doing something to benefit mankind, humankind. And instead he was, he did something that was, but that was a mistake. Like, it's not like that wasn't his intention. So uh, I, I find it very interesting. It, it, it may, it could just be Victor's, you know, own, you know, you know, drama here that I'm, you know, the, I'm like those monks in the in that circle of hell who are the hypocrites. I mean, it would be his nature to to grab something that's purely decorative rather than investing in its entirety. Uh -huh. I mean, the rest of that that is all pleasures 
of earth and sky passed before me like a dream and the thought only had to me the reality of life. Um, can you wonder that sometimes a kind of insanity possessed me or that I saw continually about me a multitude of filthy animals inflicting on me incessant torture that often extorted screams and bitter groans. I mean, he's imagining himself. The way I feel is are like the people in the Inferno, uh, in Dante's Inferno. Um, and that's, you know, that's really hard to accept, especially for modern readers, I think, that look back on this and really, you know, it's, it's, it's so evident, you know, week after week of the way people comment on this and how, you know, um, even as we started the show today, uh, Matt in the chat started off with, you know, it's, you know, time to dog pile on Victor. Um, the, uh, but that happens every week. <laughs> that um, uh, I've asked this question very early on um, when we were doing this. I don't know if it was you. I think it might've been with Lauren and Mary, but can, can, can we read Victor as in any way, you know, heroic? Um, and it could be a hero that falls, certainly, but is, is what is he ever viewed by especially I think the, the readers of, of, of the time when it was first published, is he seen as a, can he be seen as a kind of Byronic hero who just suffers because of this great thing that he tried to do? I think there's merit to that. I mean, it's that tricky question that we always ask when examining literature from, from a completely different, um, from a completely different mindset, shall mm -hmm. we say. Like we have to divorce ourselves from the way that we think and what modern psychology tells us and all this sort of stuff to really tap into that. I think it's certainly possible that he was written that way, that, that Victor was originally constructed that way. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it would be atypical for literature of the time to focus on what we would either call an unreliable narrator or um, basically an unattractive central figure. Like the notion of a, of an unsympathetic protagonist is something that didn't really come into favor for a little while after this, or at least not as a, as a mode of creation. But think of it this way, if he's in a Shakespearean, if this is a play written by Shakespeare and he takes this kind of character, now we saw it a little bit with, um, uh, let's say like Marlowe's Faust. Um, oh yeah. Maybe that's, maybe that's a better example. I, I don't know, Faust is kind of heroic. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Faustus is, he is presented as a heroic figure. He makes, you know, he's got the flaw and he has a tragic fall and all that sort of thing. But I, I mean, I would argue the same thing with Shakespeare. You quoted from Shylock earlier. Yeah. It's really interesting. Like that's a care. I'm fascinated by the character of Shylock because it has changed so much from the yeah. time of Britain. Now, Hath Not a Jew is like, Shakespeare created a character that is unlike any other uh, stage Jew in Renaissance literature. But at the same time, he's become this kind of I, towering figure. Yeah, he would have been played by the low comedian. It yeah. was it was a part. It was he was the villain of the play, and it was a low comedy role. You're supposed yeah. to laugh when he does that half not a Jew eye speech, like like, like this guy saying that that's hilarious, and then he's going to call for revenge. Like you recognize the irony in it right away that what he's calling for. He's calling for humanity, but he's really base and and you know he's really looking to call to call to deserve it. So, but that's, I mean, that's kind of the same thing is like, we as a people cannot look at Shylock through any other prism but our own. Yeah. And I think the same is true of Victor Frankenstein. Yeah. Um, it would be extremely difficult to read this book with our modern sensibilities and see him as anything other than the way that we discuss him every week. <laughs> Brenda asked early on that, you know, was, was wondering what a psychiatrist would diagnose Victor as. The further we go to the darker, he gets... The further we go, the darker he gets with madness, seeming like the only explanation. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a, you know, like a literary historian. So like, I, like I, that's really hard, but I, I, I have uh, read um, those kind of approaches uh, to literature. And uh, um, I once consulted a psychiatrist on uh, the Telltale Heart. Uh, hmm. and asked him to write up a like so here he is this is what he says now granted you can't question him you don't have any more but what would your impressions be from you know you know psychological point of view of hearing what this person has to say what would you think like how would you want to proceed like what do you think where direction do you think this diagnosis would be going 
Um, so, um, uh, and with Victor, we do get, it, it begs the question because we do get, so his behavior begs the question because he is so open and honest um, uh, with, you know, uh, how he feels and what he thinks about himself um, and what he thinks about what he's done. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm, I have no pretensions towards um, any sort of medical specialty or, or you know, mental health. Um, but have you ever played one? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I, pl I played several. But I think narcissism kind of hits closest to the point. Like Victor yeah. actually never thinks about anybody besides himself. Oh, I have a couple. Of, I have a couple moments later that this will come up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and someone says, anonymous, uh, the Victor created the being, abandoned the being, then abhors and laments the murders of his brothers and Justine. And after all that consents to create another mistake. Could that be the hypocrisy of which he is guilty? That's good. Yeah, that, 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 that really, that really works at, especially because it's at that moment that this is when he thinks of it after, uh, after he has, um, uh, uh, after he has made the promise, um, uh, because it is, and he, and he says that he's, oh, I, I, I think that's entirely right. It's, it's just, um, uh, not reading carefully enough because that's where the sentence begins, right? The promise mm -hmm. I had made to the demon weighed upon my mind, like Dante's iron cow on the heads of a hellish hypocrite. So, um, it is, just that it seems to me like that's what causes him to think of this image so then it would be i'm a hypocrite because i said i wouldn't create another being um uh or 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 that i have done this awful thing and now i'm going to do it again um but even even more to to intensify that i have you know i said no and then i you know and now i'm going to do it so um that if the creature is the biggest mistake ever and you want to destroy him, then of course going to make another creature is, is very hypocritical. So, so thanks for pointing that out. Anonymous, whoever you are, anonymous <laughs> attendee, because uh, I think that that is something that uh, we should have noticed right away reading this text. So well done. Um, Forest for the trees. Yeah. All righty. Um, it's just about top of the hour. Let me uh, stop here for just a moment for a mid break and let everyone know that we bring Sundays with Frankenstein to you for free as we did with Sundays with Dracula last year. So if you'd like to donate to the Rosenbach, you can do so at our website, but why not also become a member? If you're not a member already, uh, members of the Rosenbach have free and exclusive access to some programs like they did for the Frankenfilms program that Dan and I did. That was a members only program. Uh, your members also get 10% off of all of our reading courses, 50% off any Rosenbach programs. It's one coming up this week that I will tell you about in a second. And the basic membership level of the Rosenbach is actually called the Mary Shelley level. So what more, what could be more perfect for you Franken readers to join the Rosenbach at the Mary Shelley level and help us bring the books and manuscripts in our collections to life. And I want to give a shout out to some new members, people who just joined the Rosenbach over the last week. Uh, and Carmen in Philadelphia and Marina in Philadelphia joined at the Mary Shelley level this week. Susan and Carol, uh, both from Philadelphia, joined at the Abigail Adams level, as did Randall in Glen Mills, PA. And uh, joining at the Phyllis Wheatley level, Karen from Haverford, PA. So if any of you are watching, uh, thank you so much for your support. And also to everyone who has joined the Rosenbach or given a donation. Uh, your support helps us to continue to make this show uh, helps the Rosenbach continue to create programs and care for our collections. So thank you all very much. Uh, we have a really cool program coming up this week. Let me share the web page for that right now. And that is 
Reading Octavia Butler's Fledgling in conversation with Jerry Canavan and Nisi Shaw, uh, the Library of America has just recently released an edition of Octavia Butler, two novels, Kindred and Fledgling and Collected Stories. And Fledgling is a vampire science fiction novel that Octavia Butler had written. It's well regarded. Um, and the editors of that Library of America edition are going to do a virtual program with me talking about Fledgling. And um, uh, it should be really exciting. That is this Wednesday night at seven o'clock. So you can register for that. And if you're a Rosenbach member, you get 50% off of that program. You all know we do a lot of vampire related programs and this is one of them. And uh, I can't wait for this one. I'm also teaching this novel as part of my Read the Blood of Dracula uh, series. Uh, next month, this, this will be the novel that, that we're gonna that I'm going to teach, and we'll have a full, you know, contingent of you all uh, students who, who will sign up to do it and talk about it with me. Uh, you can also register for that. But if you head, just head over to our, you know, calendar on our program page, and we are just chock full of programs. You know, this is this is the end of March, but you know, as we get into April, there's just so much to do at the Rosenbach from courses and programs and all kinds of stuff. So. Um, Lots to do, head on over, register for something. Some of them are free, some of them cost, but if you're a member, you're half price off. Some of the, the, the courses, you get 10% off if you're a member. So much to do at the Rosenbach that uh, I can't even tell you everything that you can do. So the, um, that, is that it? Do I have anything else I needed to plug? Let me check. Sorry, I lost that page. No, that's it. Just come to a lot of stuff. So You're not gonna plug the swag? So what's that? We sold out of the swag and then we <laughs> took orders for more swag, which are being f uh, filled right now. We're waiting for that to arrive. And we did order extras. And as soon as we fulfill all those other orders, then we can put the swag back up, the swag that we have left over up and sell that. So if you haven't ordered yet, there will be very limited supplies available for you to order. Um, and, uh, and, and hope, and that'll, that's all going to sell fast too. So, you know, all, all I could say is if, if, if you wind up never getting any swag, tell us, and if enough people tell us clearly we can, you know, make more. So, uh, for these handy glasses and, and shirts. So you got yours, right? I did. I, I actually feel very remiss for not drinking from it today and lording it over all the people who want it and don't have it. <laughs> so, all righty. Um, Back to the um, uh, back to the novel. Now we've ended volume two, and now we're at the beginning of volume three in the eighteen eighteen edition. If you're reading from one of that from the later eighteen thirty one, I don't even know what chapter you're in now because those chapters are just continuous. Um, Can I dive back into that last chapter for just something small? Yeah, definitely. It's one of the it's one of those things. But I was reading this, and it really. Um, it really kind of leapt out at me uh, because of my my pop cultureness. Like one of the reasons I'm here is to talk about movies and, and all this kind of thing. But that you, you quote you read at the beginning, if I cannot inspire love, I will cause fear. It kind of pricked my ears up because Peter Boyle says that in Young Frankenstein. He does. Yeah, he does. So it's like even in something that's that's exclusively parody. Well, not exclusively, but is purports to be parody and comedic. It is. It's very folk, but it's also very focused on the films and not the very much so. Yeah. So for it to draw something directly from the source material is really kind of lovely. And then on the literary side of things, I love, and I, I know that it wasn't necessarily originally intended as a three volume novel, but structurally, this is perfect. Because we end with a legit cliffhanger where the will he won't he. He's promised the creature, but he's struggling with it like. The, the readers certainly leave with the notion that the next journey of the book might be C Victor creating another creature. Yeah. Like imagine, you know, you're doing like the lending libraries through the mail and you've got to wait for volume three and you're left with this intensely like gripping cliffhanger. And then you come back for the, for the first chapter of volume three of this book and it just puts the screws to it even more where Victor's father goes, I think you should get married. 
I just, structurally, it's so delicious in terms of the way that the tension yeah. just ramps up as we go into the final, the final stretch of the book. So that's what I wanted to speak to. It just tickles me to no end. And for those of you watching too, this is um, four weeks. There's, we have four more weeks. Uh, right. uh, this is a lot quicker because we've done two chapters, you know, a week here uh, as well. And uh, in, in four weeks, we'll be done and we'll all be sad as those last weeks are coming on. So it's four weeks and then we have an after show. So yeah. we still have a little time. But uh, but for now, we're still, you know, we still have plenty to do. Um, Victor's um, waiting uh, day after day, week after week passed on my return to Geneva unable to overcome my repugnance to the task which has enjoined me like uh, and then I could not compose a female without again devoting several months to profound study and laborious disquisition uh, and then he remembers ah there were some discoveries made by an English philosopher and, and maybe I should go to England um, uh, so he's unable to get to work right away and for, for various reasons, which actually seems to be legitimate, but, um, but, but this English philosopher, and this hits all the, like every annotated has like a different thing, like what could he be talking about? Um, one, of our, one of the people in our audience, uh, Adam, who usually asks questions, I think I have a question from Adam later um, about something, unless I blew through it. No, it's a little later, but he mentioned that he read a piece where uh, a scholar was um, wondering if she wasn't uh, throwing a hint out there at uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, at her mother, um, considering this is written earlier um, and uh, that maybe she was referring to that English philosopher, the writer of Vindication of the Rights of Woman, as Victor's about to go out and make a woman. Um, uh, and I and I it, could it be Godwin, you know, as as a political philosopher that that he is known as. Um, I, I mean, I just think it's far more likely that philosopher here stands for natural philosopher. Um, that that's and that that phrase has been used in this novel, and that's the that he's he needs some kind of there's some kind of scientist somewhere in England that's doing some kind of work that applies to him and. Whether or not, I think Les Klinger proposes that, you know, you could really make a good case for Erasmus Darwin. Um, it's, it, it does, I think the text does say, because she says English philosopher, you do start to wonder if she doesn't have somebody in mind. So, um, but we won't know. I mean, there's no other, I mean, I've combed this. I mean, there's, I, I can't see how, and when he gets to England, I, I, I don't, I don't see any, I don't see any clues as to who she could have been thinking of. But it would be really cool if she met her mother. <laughs> so I need to talk to that philosopher who wrote the Vindication of the Right of, of the Rights of Woman before I, you know, uh, uh, do this. But you know, there's. If only there had been more fan fiction then, Mary would have thought, I should put my mother in this book. Um, oh, well, we've had that. Like, uh, uh, Paul, uh, well, Polidori's still writing it or, or has just written it, the, the, the vampire, where he puts, you know, the, creates the vampire as Byron. And Byron's turning up in books, but it doesn't happen that often, except for maybe Paradise Lost, which I think uh, Dr. Lauren, uh, uh, um, Dr. Lauren Nixon described as. Uh, um, Bible fan fiction anyway. So that's Paradise Lost. But I, I wish she had used her mother here. So that would be cool. But she doesn't. So I don't know. You don't have any ideas like English philosophy. No, I don't. I, it, to me, it feels very convenient. So it's like, we just want to go to England. So here's a little excuse. <laughs> yeah. Alexander von Humboldt, uh, somebody recommends. Um, uh, Nicole does. Um, the, uh, yeah, I just... I, I, I wonder if there is anybody in, in, uh, in Shelley's mind, in Mary Shelley's mind as to who this could be. But, but it is, it is a, a nice way to, let's bring him to England. Let's, let's move characters around the continent. Um, uh, this, this is a very universal um, novel. We, you know, we, we're, we're moving all through Europe here. Um, and then we'll, you know, up to England and then we'll hit Ireland. And, the, and then obviously at the end, the creature, you know, and Victor wind up in the Arctic and the creature talks about South America and they read ruins of empires and they talk about other continents and places. So 
So it's uh, it's it's a universal story. And Victor wants to get to England now, um, but his melancholy, which every now and then would return by fits, and with a devouring blackness overcast the approaching sunshine. Um, that that his melancholy is like a weather event, right? And a weather event that they were all too common, that was all too common in 1816 when they were themselves in Geneva, you know, the like the the, the clouds, you know, coming in and um uh and, and devouring blackness suddenly coming in. Uh, Byron has that uh, poem Darkness. Do you know that poem? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Byron's poem Darkness, which he writes that summer and which is this apocalyptic vision poem, uh, partly inspired by the fact that at noon they had to start lighting all the candles in the house. That's how dark it was. Um, uh, and, and the idea that in the middle of summer, it's dark at noon might lead you to think that, you know, the world might be about to end. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and that's the kind of thing that he talks about that that's the metaphor that Victor is using for his, his own melancholy uh, and uh, is this, uh, um, apocalyptic weather event will happen. Um, and he goes out in his boat again. We talked about, I, I don't know, last week or the week before, he likes to go out in his boat and float around just, just like Mary and Percy did um, uh, when they were uh, uh, there that summer. And then even the, the, the two years before when they were they first eloped there, um, they, they did this as well um, uh, on a lake alone in a little boat, watching the clouds and listening to the rippling of the waves, silent and listless. Um, Victor should be doing something, not sitting in a boat, uh, listless. <laughs> uh, and his father calls him, his father, then he goes in, he talks to his father. His father is a little worried that Victor's a little too melancholy here. And um, and he asks him, he just what it's basically what's the matter, right? Like I've always and and um uh and and he right away assumes that it is about maybe the marriage with Elizabeth that is coming up. Um he says, um uh he wants to know what's the matter. I've always looked forward to your marriage with your cousin as the tie of our domestic comfort and stay of my declining years. Uh, you perhaps regard her as your sister without any wish that she might become your wife. Um, and, you know, it's like, maybe you, maybe you think she's your sister and you don't want to marry her. Like, is that what's bugging you here? And, you know, and Victor says, no, that's no, you know, reassure yourself. I love my cousin tenderly and sincerely. I mean, he's already called her my more than sister earlier in the novel. Don't worry, dad, she's my more than sister. Uh, a little creepy. Um, a little. <laughs> yeah, I never saw any woman who excited as Elizabeth does. My warmest admiration and affection. So he's being very, you know, respectful about it here. Great praise. Great praise. My warmest admiration and affection. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants to hear that. I dare you, Ed, I dare you to say that to your wife at dinner tonight. <laughs> As like the Valentine wish, you know, you have my warmest admiration and affection. Um, <laughs> my, but <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't go over. Um, he says, uh, oh, my wife's watching. Maybe she'll even throw in the chat there. So, <laughs> the um, uh, the um, uh, Victor. Uh, but 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 he goes on. He says, but but it's like he's here, like my future hopes and prospects are entirely bound up in the expectation of our union. Again, that's still very unromantic, but it's, you know, um, uh, it is, he, he's, he's, he, he, he's full in, like I'm, I'm completely in, like, yes, I'm going to marry her. I absolutely want to marry her. This is all, you know, a good thing for, for everybody here. So, um, uh, maybe you should ask Elizabeth, um, <laughs> just as, and here again, you get, you get, you have these two men, discussing what's going to happen to the woman in their, you know, uh, that they Absolutely. control it. So. Yeah, they, they decide her fate regardless of what she might have to say or feel about it. And, and this is clearly something that, that concerns Mary Shelley as an author, that is clearly something that concerned, you know, her mother uh, uh, in, in the works that she wrote and how women are virtually powerless. Um, and, and Elizabeth is put in a really powerless position in this novel. And I, I think that is a criticism. I think that is clearly a, 
um, uh, the reader is supposed to pay attention to the fact that the men get to run this show and the women don't have a say in it. Um, uh, and we'll get a little bit of Elizabeth in a bit, but um, it is obvious that she doesn't get to um, uh, really have a, have a true say. I mean, they kind of say she does, but they're literally planning her future as well as their own right now. Um, and uh, so, so Victor says, yes, definitely. And then the father says, he even he like, he, well, then, you know, you should have an early marriage. You should marry now. Um, that's a good idea. And everybody will all be happier and you'll be happier. Of course, Elizabeth will be happier because we'll be happy. Um, but, but I think, I think this is fascinating too. Did you pick up on this? That Victor just went through a scene where he was the father, right? Yeah. And his son, the creature, was asking for a mate. The balance of these two scenes against each other is fascinating on any number of levels. And I think not least of all, something I want to bring up, like we, we joke about, you know, the, the uh, exciting, my warmest admiration and affection and like the clinical sort of heightened nature of the way that they speak. Like the father's response, I love this. The expression of your sentiments on this subject, my dear Victor, gives me more pleasure than I have for some time experienced is something that nobody in life has ever possibly remotely said. Like the dialogue in, in this book is fascinating in that it's all very florid um, and only occasionally dips into, into something that, that is colloquial or, or people might actually say. But the thing that I, would, that I would posit is that if you balance this conversation against the conversation we just had with the creature, that one carries so much more direct emotional impact and resembles at times things that people might actually say to each other. It's a little overly constructed in terms mm -hmm. of like how an argument might be built. But to think that he has, that Victor has a more direct, open, impassioned conversation with the creature than he does with his own father about the prospect of marriage yeah. is fascinating to me. Yeah. Like you know, if, if I, if that's how I spoke, if my father and I spoke to each other like that, I would jump off a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> um, they are, uh, it's, it's also what the, it's in, in the case of Victor and the creature, it's the, it's the son asking the father for, to marry someone. And I need you to, you know, create someone for me to marry. Like I need you to find my wife. And in this case with Victor and his father, his father did. He literally did that. Mm -hmm. They brought this young girl into their house and raised her with the prospects that she will one day marry Victor. She was invented to marry him. Yeah, after that, that she is she is a a Frankenstein creation, um, but a creation of Alphonse and and uh, uh, what's the mother's name? Caroline. Uh, yeah. it's he's a, she's a creation of the of the two parents, um, uh, and which makes her you know, a far more, you know, desirable creation, uh, a far more, you know, th this is the way it should be done in a sense. Um, I love that. She is a Frankenstein creation, which of course in the, in the Branagh movie gets pushed even further where she then becomes, becomes the bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. And it's, and I, I was thinking the 1831 edition, which, which, which it becomes intent, but because she's not a cousin, that idea is intensified even more that we've just gone out and found a stranger, a poor kid and a poor orphan and brought her into this world and really created her into this, you know, genteel young, you know, woman of a certain class when she wasn't born into that at all. So the 1831 edition is it really does make her more of a creation. It's Pygmalion. It's, it's, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, Pygmalion into my fair lady this notion of like taking someone and making them into making them into something yeah so um the <clears throat> so that's they have this discussion and and I I especially wanted to point out the parallels for that we've had two discussions now about getting married and you know the first one isn't recognized as a getting married you know uh confrontation but that's kind of what's going on uh, the partner, the, partner. the um, uh, and nobody's considering the thoughts of the of the of the partner of the mate of the woman in this. So, uh, Victor listens to his father, and um, 
And then he thinks, alas to me, the idea of an immediate union with my cousin was one of horror and dismay. Um, that he, he was, I am, I was bound by a solemn promise, which I had not yet fulfilled and dared not break. Um, what manifold miseries might impend over me and my devoted family. And he has the deadly weight yet hanging round my neck and bowing me to the ground. Another reference to? Those cowls, the, the Dante cowls? Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. The oh, damn, yeah, of course. Bow his neck. I don't know how many rhyme uh, allusions are in this novel. It's like three or four. It's, <laughs> uh, I think we've already had two, if not one. I think there might have been two. This might be the third, and I'm certain there's one later. Um, so, uh, yeah, Mary Shelley is, I mean, I, I just think <laughs> with the number of times she mentions rhyme and knowing her biography of hearing it as a child, hearing Coleridge himself read it, this is, you know, extraordinarily important poem for her. And, and again, it's just another reminder of how that connects with this, with this novel that, you know, the, the, the theme of that, that, that doing this committing an awful sin in, in Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, where he, 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 he shoots the albatross and kills it. And not only he is punished, but everybody on his ship is punished for this. Um, and then he has to wander and tell this story. Um, uh, it's a powerful, you know, uh, uh, kind of it, it powerfully inspires this novel and also to remember that it's a choice thing. Like he, like he doesn't know why he does it, but he does it. And it is someone who makes a mistake and then has to pay the price for that, just as Victor does. But of course, we see in the, in the 1831 revisions that it, that, that it becomes more of an fa inexorable fate, you know, is, is what drives him on and not necessarily a choice. But with the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, you know, allusions all throughout here, uh, that for me is a reminder of the choice. Uh, that he makes. But all through that paragraph, I listened to my father in silence and remained for some time and down to I allowed myself to enjoy the delight of a union from which I expect a peace. His father has asked him about maybe he should marry early. And Victor's worried about A, marrying early and B, the creature. So he's worried about his family and what he has to, and then this creature thing. And we get, I listened, uh, I revolved, um, I was bound, I had not yet fulfilled. If I did, I, could I, did, like I must perform, I left, like I expect a piece. It's all about I, 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 I. It's all about himself. He is faced with an issue about his family and, and Elizabeth and the creature and his response is I, 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 all the way through his, all the way through this. Um, this is this is who I mean, you, you mentioned the narcissism earlier. That's who Victor is. So um, he decides. Well, we have some. We have an interesting thing here because Victor decides on a uh, a two year vacation. That's what I should do. Uh, I delighted with the idea of spending a year or two in change of scene and variety of occupation and absence from my family during which period some event, something might happen, which would restore me to them in peace and happiness. My promise might be fulfilled and the monster have departed or some accident might occur to destroy him and put an end to my slavery forever. Um, that's just ridiculous. That is, you know, like, I'll just take two years off and maybe it'll go away or maybe I'll do it and it'll go away. Um, time's not gonna solve this, but two things I have on this. Um, First, the, in the 1831 edition, um, Victor is, it, it, there's a, it gives, there's a kind of a more realistic, you know, thing here about Victor um, taking this two-year break. That were the necessary reasons for him to leave home, is what I should say. And that happens right here. And he says, in the 1831, it says, the latter method of obtaining the desired intelligence was dilatory and unsatisfactory. Besides, I had an insurmountable aversion to the idea of engaging myself in my loathsome task in my father's house while in the habits of familiar intercourse with those I love. So like number one, getting information is, is difficult and I need to change that to do that. And I can't make a creature in this house. Um, and that's reasonable, it really is. <laughs> 
He says, I know that a fear, a thousand fearful accidents might occur, the slightest of which would disclose a tale to thrill all connected with me with horror. Um, that's an interesting line that she adds, because that also echoes a line in, in the 1831 introduction she wrote to the novel to create a tale of thrilling horror um, is, is Mary Shelley's goal that she says for this novel. And Victor says that, um, that, uh, that people could, that doing this might disclose a tale to thrill all connected with me with horror. Um, I was aware also that I should often lose all self-command, all capacity of hiding the harrowing sensations that would possess me during the progress of my unearthly occupation. I must absent myself from all I loved while thus employed. Um, the, um, uh, it's, it's reasonable. Like it makes sense that you shouldn't make the creature here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that you should go away to do this. Um, but there's another very interesting thing about this. And it's that I, I think I sent this to you earlier. The yeah. in the in the manuscript for this novel, let me share this page from the Shelley Godwin archive, which has the manuscript for the novel or the leftover draft and uh, of it. And um, let me share that part of it here. And here it is, and on this page, and look at all this cross out here. Whoops, look at all this cross out here along, the, along her draft. And that goes on for about three pages because Mary has written all of this and then she winds up cutting a lot of this out and actually just rewriting it is what she does. Rewriting it to reflect this comment that Percy makes on the right on the side here of the of the of the of the draft and it is because originally she has victor's father say i know what you should do you should go off and take the grand tour you should you should before you get married you should go off and travel for a little while and that'll help you overcome your melancholy and it'll help you settle you before you get married and percy writes i think the journey to england ought to be Victor's proposal uh, that he ought to go for the purpose of collecting knowledge for the formation of a female. He ought to lead his father to this in the conversations. Um, the conversation commences right enough, he mentions here. Like, don't cut out the opening of it. This is the way you should do it. But I, that, that's a suggestion. That he that Percy wants to make. I made it bigger here so you can all see it. This is his comment here. Um, it's a really good comment for. I, I mean, I think that works better for this novel, and and it, and it's a reminder that um, that they're collaborating on this. That she is showing him the draft, and he is not only making changes throughout it. And we can be suspicious about some of the changes in this because it's clear that she's critiquing, you know, some of the the, the ways he's living his life and some of the beliefs that he has in it which he never catches on to, it seems. And maybe she doesn't know that she's even doing it. Who knows, um, critiquing him that way. But, but they're clearly working on this. And he makes a really good suggestion because I think it's important that Victor does this at this point, that um, this shouldn't be just some kind of happenstance things that comes from his father, that he should just make this, what, what is in effect the grand tour? I call it that. And that's, I mean, it, she doesn't say that in her, um, uh, uh, in, in the way when she has the father say it um but that's in effect what it is it's it's the it's the grand tour it's you're you're a rich young man you should go off and see the world some before you you know settle into a life um but percy thinks that the um that it should come from victor that the you know uh the, for the purpose of collecting knowledge for the formation of the female he ought to you know go away and it should be his choice too, which I think is, is a good thing, especially in this novel where I think that it's his choices are um, um, causing the misery, are the problem. So, um, 
and that's uh and then she what Mary Shelley did she just kind of she 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 changes it she cuts out what she had written and then it's Victor making the thing but actually she just kind of takes what she has written and just kind of combines it in that there aren't there aren't a lot of other, other great changes in that in in doing that um so uh in that revision i don't think it reveals all that much else um as something else will in a bit um but then um what's victor say um uh oh and the idea that i'll put an end to my slavery forever like you know so you know, so misreading, like you're not like, I, I, it's fascinating in the novel that this happens, that the creature calls him like, you're my slave now, you have to do this, and, and Vinny is his slave, but but the idea of, of Victor, you know, feeling this way and expounding on this is my misery that I'm a slave to this, of something that, he, a situation that he has caused from the beginning is, um, uh, is yeah, annoying. So Victor's annoying. Victor's annoying, everyone. <laughs> To the surprise of nobody. Hot tip. Uh, the, uh, but I, I clothe my desires uh, under the um, guise of wishing to travel and see the world before I sat down for life within the walls of my native town. So it's Victor's like, this is like, I need to travel, dad, to go see the world a little bit. Like she had originally had his father proposed. Um, but really it is because he needs some information in England and he wants to get away from them. And uh, and then we have this great line here, a more about his father, a more indulgent and less and less dictatorial parent did not exist upon earth. Victor's father is the greatest father in the world. Uh, and he is. Well, maybe not to Elizabeth, but <laughs> um, but uh, but I but I, I get the feeling that the way he's written, if Elizabeth says, I don't want to marry him, Victor's father would be like, then you're never marrying him like he would be on her side. Um, the way that he's put together in this and, and what we've had from him already, that they would take that into account. Um, and um, it's obviously, you know, we've already to contrast that with Victor and the creature, like Victor's the worst father on earth um, uh, to his, you know, son and, and his dad is perfect, but, but also that kind of almost wish fulfillment on the author's part, you know, Amer and Percy, Percy has a disastrous relationship with his father. Um, but it's all Percy's fault anyway. Um, Mary, though, um, I'm not sure it's all her fault. Um, clearly, she makes a choice, and her father reacts to that. She has made a choice, um, but the the way she is treated by her father is uh, certainly not. Uh, um, uh, he didn't do well, William Godwin, and all this. He doesn't do well as an old man at all. He's terrible throughout the rest of his life. Um, but. Uh, but that wish fulfillment, she donates, she, she dedicates the novel to him. Um, she really wants him back in her life. Uh, and she did have a very close relationship with him, especially when she was very young. He did make sure she got, you know, a great education, uh, even though he couldn't send her to school and do those kinds of formal things with her. Um, but, I, you know, at the moment when she's writing this, she's, you know, she, she's still ostracized. He won't speak to her. And she's writing about a father who is the, you know, uh, the, the perfect father on earth. So um, he makes the arrangements for his journey. And, um, but one feeling haunted me, he says, um, that he's worried what's going to happen with the creature and his family. He says, through the whole period during which I was the slave of my creature, I, I allowed myself to be governed by the impulses of the moment. Um, actually, it's before that. Before, first, he worries what's going to happen with his family when he's gone. Then he worries. Then, then he goes into this, that, you know, I allowed myself to be governed by the impulses of the moment. My present sensations strongly intimated that the fiend would follow me and exempt my family from the danger of his machinations. Um, uh, again, another acknowledgement that he's the slave of his creature, that he is the one now in the powerless position. Um, and also like the creature, he's governed by the impulses of the moment. I mean, that's just what the creature does. The creature says like, oh, I'll be reasonable. I'll be, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, 
I'm not going to threaten you and then threaten you. And yeah, like he can't like, you know, he just, you know, and we, we had this in the last couple chapters last week. Every time he says like, oh, I'm not going to be mad. And then I get mad. Um, uh, they, they, he can't he can't control himself. Um, and uh, and the novel seems to make the strong case that it's because he's not it's his education. It's the way he's been hasn't been taught It's the, because of the neglect that he doesn't know how to do this. But Victor. Victor had an education and had the family and still can't. So I'm not sure how that works here. You know, like Victor can't do it either. And he's had the education. He's had the family. Um, uh, it still comes down to, you know, your own choice, like what you do, your own, you know, your own, not just abilities, but your own behavior and uh and how you practice what you've learned and what you've inherited uh hey we get to elizabeth um you know long last <laughs> she approved of the reasons of my departure uh only regretted that she had not the same opportunities of enlarging her experience and cultivating her understanding like yeah you know um you're you're you know and and uh, I love that that little line is in there. Um, that Mary is not going to let this go by. The author is not going to let this go by without mentioning that. Yeah, Elizabeth doesn't have the, the Elizabeth isn't even allowed to go on a little vacation and learn and these. Nobody guys. would dare suggest that she might perhaps go with him. It, yeah, and it will be <laughs> interesting because well, you know, because this is what you know. This is. This is Mary Shelley's life that she does take the trip with her, you know, uh, her intended. But if she's trying to write a novel that is, you know, that maybe in her secret heart, she's hoping her father will start talking to her again. She's certainly not going to suggest that Elizabeth do what she has done. But of course, you know, I mentioned this before. I, I think the, I think William Godwin's, you know, real anger comes about because Percy is married and has children and is not taking care of his children. And Godwin is at a point in his life where he recognizes that you actually have to take care of your family. Um, you can't, not allowed to abandon them uh, uh, as happened to his wife, as happened to Mary Wollstonecraft when she had a child, her first child, Fanny and Gilbert Imlay just abandoned her. Um, that is what Godwin sees Percy doing to his first wife. And then is furious about it. Of course, he continues to talk to Percy, write to Percy. He just won't write to his daughter. So, and that's where he becomes, you know, a jerk. So. <laughs> so Elizabeth regrets she can't go. And then she says, oddly enough, um, uh, we all depend upon you. Uh, like you do? <laughs> he's not even there for a year what's what's he away five years six years yeah and then they don't depend upon him he's the only one in the family they don't depend upon because he just keeps leaving them uh but but she clarifies it you if you are miserable what must be our feelings and um and that's true. And that's unfortunate for them that they are relying on Victor to be the one to, you know, uh, be the happy one. And then they will also be happy if he is. Um, uh, but it also drives home that point that, that it's, it's the family connection that is more, it's the message of this novel that the most important thing is you need to stay and remain connected to those around you. It's what the creature wants. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's what it's what Victor keeps abandoning, uh, uh, that then has consequences. Um, and Victor's responsible response to all this is, I threw myself into the carriage that was to convey me away, like this petulant schoolboy, right? Hardly knowing whither I was going and careless of what was passing around. Um, this is the most Verter like moment in this for Victor. You know, we talked about last week the Sar as a young Verter and uh, and how that's, you know, um, uh, the, the, that passionate feeling young person and how they react to the world is important, but of course it can have disastrous results. And um, 
Uh, and Godwin even called his wife, Mary Wollstonecraft, he called her the female Verter in a complimentary way in that she really invested in, uh, in, in, in the passions that she felt in experiencing the world. Um, but, uh, but Victor's like the, well, he's like the jerk Verter, the jerker um, that, you know, get over yourself kind of thing, right? So. He was filled with dreary imaginations. I passed through many beautiful and majestic scenes, but my eyes were fixed and unobserving. I could not think of the bourne of my travels and the work to, which was to occupy me whilst they endured. Um, you know, I you know, I, I can't even I, I can't even enjoy the scenery. <laughs> I have no sympathy for Victor. All my sympathy with Victor is gone. I tried so hard to keep sympathy for him. This is it out of this entire book. The fact that he can't enjoy the scenery is what does it for you, Ed? It's the last straw. <laughs> it, is the, it is the facing Elizabeth and saying, you know, and her saying like, we rely on you. And his response is like, oh, and he gets yeah. in the carriage. and drives. I really wish I could go around the country and just see the world. And he's like, mad to hell with it. <laughs> That's, yeah, it's the last straw for me. Let's see if I can, you know, <laughs> like him at all later. So um, the, uh, and then after some days spent in listless indolence, then he meets up with Clairval, with Henry. Um, the, uh, um, Adam had a question here. He sent me as an email uh, that uh, um, I'll ask you and, and we'll see if we can, do this concerning Victor's need to study and prepare more for creating a mate for the creature. Is it just a plot device to bring Clairval back into the story and to justify Victor's traveling? Or do you think that MWS is trying to say something related to gender? And if so, what? Um, that the guys have to get together. Um, I mean, I think that's a great question. I, I think the arrival, the re-arrival of Clairval is really interesting and, and certainly here is used exclusively to point out the difference between yeah. the difference between man and man, if you will. Yeah. Um, I do think there's something about, you know, again, everything with his family like is very kind of formal and I won't say stilted, but you know, his, his leave taking from Elizabeth is something. And then Clairval shows up and is the ultimate, like, if there was ever more of a good time, Charlie, in literature, I defy you to find it. Yeah. Like, Clairval is a guy kicking around and living the dream. And I certainly, you know, bromance is a thing. Like, there are people who would probably read into it and ask about the hom homoerotic implications oh, of it. Whoa, 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 Walton better, you know, come on. You got to ship, you got to ship Victor and Walton, not, not Victor and Clara Val, so... You know, but I mean, that's it. Like the sense of the sense of male camaraderie in this book is is fascinating. And and actually Clairval and Victor and Walton and Victor end up having the kind of relationship that I believe the being would long for. Yeah. A kinship. Uh, yeah. So maybe I, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. With that. And the first thing you said, too, that like that the, the contrast between the two of them is really important for, you know, Shelley as an author to convey here that like, this is the way Victor is behaving. Look, here's another guy, and this is how he, you know, reacts to the world. The poetry of it all, like the poetry yeah. with which Clairval responds. We'll definitely have that in a second. I want you to read that. But the um, uh, uh, just to also mention too that um, actually Clairval joining in the 1831 edition, she changes it, and huh. Clairval still joins, but she it's not. It's something actually that Victor's father and Elizabeth arrange. That's Victor wants to be alone, but they arrange for Clairval to join him and he comments on that. And that's interesting because that actually works better because he should want to be alone, completely alone to do this. That's the, that's the weird question is like, if he needs to go off alone to do this, what the hell does he ask Clairval along for the ride? And I think she catches on to that and, yeah. and makes that change for her 1831 edition um that he uh that he joins but read that paragraph there where clairval joins i arrived in strasbourg where i waited two days for clairval and then yeah i arrived at strasbourg where i waited two days for clairval he came 
Alas, how great was the contrast between us. He was alive to every new scene, joyful when he saw the beauties of the setting sun and more happy when he beheld it rise and recommence a new day. He pointed out to me the shifting colors of the landscape and the appearances of the sky. This is what it is to live, he cried. Now I enjoy existence. But you, my dear Frankenstein, wherefore are you desponding and sorrowful? In truth, I was occupied by gloomy thoughts and neither saw the descent of the evening star nor the golden sunrise reflected in the Rhine. And you, my friend, who, have a, who would be far more amused with the journal of Clerval, who observed the scenery with an eye of feeling and delight than to listen to my reflections. I, a miserable wretch, haunted by a curse that shut up every avenue to enjoyment. That last line, that could, like, if I read that line to you out of context, is that the creature? Is that yeah. the creature? Like that at, literally describes both of those characters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That that Victor is, you know, and the whole path, like Victor is, you know, um, wandering dejectedly and fails to realize he has a friend with him. You are not, you know, a miserable wretch, you know, wandering the world like the creature does. You're actually like your friend is right there who's pointing out all of these things to you. Well, um, and I might even go further, like Clerval is, is the idealization of the perfect human experience. Yeah. Is, like he's, he's actually very, he's antithetical to the creature. Like everything that he sees is a wonder. He loves to, this is what it is to be alive. Yeah. So it's, I love the, the way that balance, you know, Clerval not only against Victor, but, but Clerval is like the pinnacle of what it is to, to actually live. And nobody else in the book is really doing it. No, and they, and they should be. And this is the endeavor that, you know, they're, that people are supposed to do. This is the romantic poet endeavor, you know, and we'll see yeah. that again in a little bit here too. Um, the, uh, I want to share some stuff about they take this trip up the Rhine and I want to share some parallels with, with Mary and, and Percy's life in their first visit from, the, from their six weeks tour book. Um, but also haunted by a curse that shut up. Is that another rhyme of the ancient Mariner illusion? Like that's all <laughs> I can think of now. Like every time I'm going to see something like that, I'm like, hmm, is that ancient Mariner? But because this is the storyline I think connects, but um, uh, maybe so. The um, uh, we agreed to descend the Rhine in a boat from Strasbourg to Rotterdam, and then they go on. And at one point, he says we saw many ruined castles standing on the edges of precipices, surrounded by black woods, high and inaccessible. And this like nice little description that they get going through there. Well, Mary and Percy did this trip uh, the first time when they went over in 1840 when they eloped. Uh, and, and fled England, uh, they went to Europe and they took, um, they realized that it's actually more expensive for them and arduous for them obviously to travel back across. And it was a lot cheaper for them to take a boat up the Rhine and they could you know, move a lot quicker that way before they went home. And I'm gonna share a little bit from that book. I just have a PDF of it here, which you can find online pretty easily. Um, history of the six weeks tour through a part of France, Switzerland, Germany, and Holland with letters descriptive of the sail around the Lake of Geneva and the glaciers of Chamonix. Um, uh, we, we shared this before when we talked about that sea of ice and, and how some, or, or, or the uh, um, uh, Mont Blanc, which is in here, and Shelley's poem, Percy's poem, Mont Blanc, is published at the end of this. Um, but they, let me jump ahead here. But also in this are their are passages about them traveling on the River Rhine. And here they are doing it. And there's a great scene that happens here. Uh, we return to the boat. Um, our companions in this voyage were of the meanest class, smoked prodigiously and were exceedingly disgusting. After having landed for refreshment in the middle of the day, we found on our return to the boat that our former seats were occupied. We took others when the original possessors angrily and almost with violence insisted upon our leaving them. Their brutal rudeness to us who did not understand their language provoked Shelley, she's got S here, it's Shelley, it's Percy, to knock one of the foremost down. 
<laughs> he did not return the blow, but continued his vociferations until the boatman interfered and provided us with other seats. Percy gets in a fight with, <laughs> with, with these, you know, companions of the meanest class who smoked prodigiously. In this and in Mary Shelley's letters, she is really not happy with the, the meaner sorts of people that she encounters when she travels. That she is absolutely a, considers herself a, gen, a genteel person who understands how to behave in public and doesn't like it when she sees people doing, you know, the opposite. Um, the, uh, but I just love that story of like Percy went and knocked him down. Um, uh, and then the fight. But as they're traveling to here, let me go down a little further. And we just, I just mentioned that description from Victor of seeing the, the ruined castle and the precipice. Um, here they're traveling. And while they're traveling, it says Shelley read aloud to us Mary Wollstonecraft's Letters from Norway. And we passed our time delightfully. And that's actually a publication of her mother's letters from Norway that she modeled her six weeks tour on. Like we'll have some descriptions and some letters that we wrote home and it's a little travelogue. Um, but the, uh, the evening was such as to find few parallels in beauty as it approached the banks, which had hitherto been flat and uninteresting became exceedingly beautiful. Suddenly the river grew narrow and the boat dashed with unconceivable, inconceivable rapidity round the base of a rocky hill covered with pines. A ruined tower with its desolated windows stood on the summit of another hill that jutted into the river. Beyond the sunset was illuminating the distant mountains and clouds casting the reflection of its rich and purple hues on the agitated river. I mean, I can go on and on because it's this, it's this gorgeous description of natural description of the beauty that they see from the boat. Uh, unfortunately, the people that they have to take the boat with, uh, but, but they're enjoying their trip. And that ruined castle that she mentioned, the ruined tower that she mentions here, and there's a ruined castle in the, in the thing. Um, Near the Rhine River, on all the you know one of the or the tributaries or whatever, there is in existence a Castle Frankenstein uh, or Berg Frankenstein. You would uh, that's what the, I mean. That's in German. It would be Berg Frankenstein. Um, uh, it is not named after someone named Frankenstein. It's just the name is literally a, like the like the the stone or the place or the building the, the Stein of the Franks, of the, the Frankish people who would have been in the area, would have been kind of the rulers too, you know, like the, this is the, the, the place, the, the house of the rulers or whatever, stone of the Franks. Um, so it's not named after someone named Frankenstein. Now, there is no proof that Mary and Percy knew of this place or visited it. It's actually about 10 miles from one of the places they did stop. Um, so they would have had to literally travel there if they wanted to visit it or maybe they just heard about it. Um, I find it curious because I just think it would be, it may have been where she had first heard the name Frankenstein and then winds up using it for the novel. But I don't believe there's any stronger connection than that. Like I, she did not go there and was like Castle Frankenstein. And that's like, you know, like there was no connection there. But it's complicated more by the fact that in the 17th century, an alchemist lived there by the name of Johann Conrad Dippel, D-I-P-P-E-L. And um, there are legends about, he was an alchemist. So he, he did these kind of weird scientific experiments in the 17th century. There's things about him, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know using people for his experiments, but they're all legends and it's so hard to figure out when do the legends start? Do they start you know, afterwards and then people are already connecting with Castle Frankenstein with the novel? There's no documentary evidence at all that connects Dipple with Mary or the castle, the fact that she may have heard the stories, uh, anything like that. So I think it's just a curious coincidence that winds up happening that there was a place called Castle Frankenstein and you know, um, uh, and there was an alchemist actually there in the 17th century. Um, 
it's it might seem like that has to be a connection but i i why isn't there a castle frankenstein in this novel you know like i would think that like if she had encountered it that she maybe she would have brought it in in some way and she never does so um so i have no idea if there's any connection there but i have to mention it so um people have written lots of pieces about how like you can find all these like this is how she heard of it and all that and it's complete conjecture um the um but just a little more of them traveling, like I mentioned before about how they have to travel with people and, and they don't really like it. This is Mary and Percy. And this is how different her own experience is. Like we get the Henry and, and Victor experience on the river and they're loving this. And, but for Mary and Percy, here's another one paragraph. There were only four passengers besides ourselves. Three of these were students of Strasbourg University. Schwitz, a rather handsome, good-tempered young man. Hoff, a kind of shapeless animal with a heavy, ugly German face. And Schneider, who was nearly an idiot and on whom his companions were always playing a thousand tricks. The remaining passengers were a woman and an infant. I mean, she is brutal <laughs> when she's describing the people that she meets on the trip. And then this last part here is just really hilarious. Um, and uh, um, where is it? Oh yeah, it's towards the end of this page, beginning of the next. Uh, most of our companions chose to remain in the cabin. This was fortunate for us since nothing could be more horribly disgusting than the lower order of smoking, drinking Germans who traveled with us. They swaggered and talked and what was hideous to English eyes, kissed one another. There were, however, two or three merchants of a better class who appeared well-informed and polite. So what do I learn from this? Mary Shelley would have hated traveling with me on a boat on the Rhine. So you, you drink and smoke and kiss people? Yeah, I would definitely do all those things. And, um, you know, I'd be the, I'd be the you know, smoking, drinking Irishman who traveled with us. <laughs> um, I would only kiss if I was with my wife, though. Let me just say that right off. The wow. Well um, played. The, and, and, oh, I'm sorry. There's one more thing here because this happens. Uh, at one point, Clairval uh, notes about the, the songs of the uh, laborers as they're passing by. And here it is. The, here it is. Uh, we heard the songs of the vintagers. And, um, Oh, and if surrounded by disgusting Germans, the site was not so replete with enjoyment as I now fancy it to have been. But they hear the songs of the people taking care of the, 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 the vines on the, on the banks. Um, and that also happens. Uh, we also get a description of that in this um, novel, the, the Heard the Song of the Laborers, uh, Victor says, as they're sailing by. So... Um, yeah, I knew we were going to run out of time because we always do. <laughs> hey, um, uh, oh, yeah. I talk too much. Sorry. Uh, the uh, not sorry. Um, the uh, Clairval is just, you know, uh, uh, the the companion that Victor needs, but doesn't, you know, take advantage of it. Um, and then Victor talks about him being formed in the very poetry of nature. Um. And Mary even has, oh, it's informed in the very poetry of nature, his wild and enthusiastic imagination was chastened by the sensibility of his heart. His soul overflowed with ardent affections and his friendship was of that devoted and wondrous nature that the worldly minded teach us to look for only in the imagination. So he's, you know, he's the perfect companion, but Victor, and, and he acknowledges this, but he doesn't seem to learn or to, or to copy what he's doing. But that very poetry of nature, and Mary Shelley even has a, a, a note that it's from Lee Hunt's Ramini in this. Do you know that story? No. That is the story of Francesco and Paolo, um, the lovers who are also in uh, Dante's Inferno. Um, uh, Lee Hunt wrote a, wrote a long poem that published called The Story of Ramini, published in 1816 about the lovers Francesca and Paolo. And they're kind of famous lovers because of Dante and people write about them. And people in the 19th century, especially, there are a lot of paintings, the pre-Raphaelites loved this couple. They, Francesca was married to Paolo's brother, uh, Duke Giovanni of Rimini. 
um, hence the Ramini here. And Paolo becomes her tutor to his sister-in-law. And then they start reading Lancelot and Guinevere stories and they fall in love. Cause of course you would. Um, and Dante puts these two lovers in the second circle of hell, um, which is for the lustful. So they're in hell, but hey, they're only on the second circle. So they're not like the worst, like at the ninth, but they're, they're still, they're in hell for the lustful and um uh and they're like tongues of flame i think or i i, I think they're in a war i can't remember like they're they're you know they're perpetually you know in pain obviously everybody in hell is um but it's the second dante reference in two chapters um <laughs> that we've had uh um uh, she, i mean she says it's lee hunts ramini that's where everybody gets it from dante and um and of course while frankenstein is being written and after it's published Mary and Percy are reading Dante's Commedia. Um, they are, uh, uh, we have the records from their journals <clears throat> that they're both reading the Commedia over these couple of years, um, uh, learning the Italian, but also reading the Henry Carey trans English translation. So, um, but that he was being formed in the very poetry of nature, the poetry of nature. And then these, the wonderful description of what that's like, this kind of person, but you know, is it he's like Werther and 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 we also get the suffering of the lovers here um so it's you know I, I say that Victor like Clairval is a perfect companion he should be modeling himself after him but we also firmly know that that can also be a bad thing um because Francesca and Paolo are in hell <laughs> um it's you know, it's sure it, 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 it sure is exciting and, and, pa and to read about their passion and how committed they are to each other that they can now burn forever in hell because they are. Um, uh, and and it's, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go too far from, especially, you know, when Mary thinks about her and Percy, you know, defying the odds, defying the law, um, already married, but he's already married, but we are in love with each other and we deserve to be together. Um, so... Uh, so that bit of bio is there as well. Um, we get some Wordsworth. You want to read the Wordsworth? Sure. And this is from Tintern Abbey, everyone. Lines written a few miles above Tintern Abbey, something like that. Um, uh, go ahead, read, read, read the piece that's there. Yep. The sounding cataract haunted him like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms were then to him an appetite, a feeling, and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied or any interest unborrowed from the eye. And then read that next paragraph. And where does he now exist in this gentle and lovely being lost forever? Is this, excuse, is this gentle and lovely being lost forever? Has his mind so replete with ideas, imaginations, fanciful and magnificent, which formed a world whose existence depended on the life of its creator. Has this mind perished? Does it now only exist in my memory? No, it is not thus. Your form so divinely wrought and being with beauty has decayed, but your spirit still visits and consoles your unhappy friend. Pardon this gush of sorrow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we get this well, first we get a little hint, Henry's doomed. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's more than a little hint, I think. <laughs> um, and to pardon this gush, I like that because it's also a reminder that he's telling the story to Walton. You know, yeah. we're brought back into that storytelling thing there that I'm telling this story to someone. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and it's the fate of Henry. But that, that's from Tintern Abbey uh, by Wordsworth. Uh, another you know, important romantic poet and, and, and of, the, of the kind of earlier generation, you know, Wordsworth and Coleridge are writing at the end of the 18th century, right around when Mary is born, uh, a little after that, but when she's a small child. And then this kind of next generation of romantic poets, the, you know, Col uh, you know Percy Shelley and Byron and, and Keats, they're, they're kind of another generation. It's not quite a generation separating, but they're the youngers. The younger ones coming up, but 
but in in Wordsworth's in this poem, Tintern Abbey, it's a long poem. Um, it's about the narrator returning to this place that he was somewhere in the past. Uh, this scene of ruins, there's a ruins of Tintern Abbey there and it's and the natural scene around it and leading up to it and being there. Um, and actually it's interesting because just a few lines before this part that she pulls out is uh, the lines um, uh, that uh, um, he says, I dare and so I dare to hope though changed no doubt from what I was when first I came among these hills when like a row, I bounded over the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever, na wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. Um, and there's a couple lines and then the, the what, what was quoted, but that more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. Well, clearly that's Victor. I can't believe you left that out, Mary. Um, why did you put those lines in there? Because that's literally what you know he's doing. Um, and the, but he's comparing. He's talking about this also, like Clairval, and this is what leads him to think of this. Because now, because the poem is about memory. Um, the uh, um, it ends with the realization that the narrator and his companion, because he's, he's talking about his companion, his dear friend and his sister, he calls my dear sister, it's Dorothy, Wordsworth's sister Dorothy is with him on this trip. And he, the poem ends with the realization that they can take sustenance in the future after this time is over that they're at, at, the, at the Abbey, um, that they will have the memory of their visit. You know, he, he calls it thy memory be as a dwelling place for all sounds and harmonies. Thy memory be as a dwelling place. So that's the way this poem ends. And for Victor, it is, um, uh, he has that very reaction because now when he's in the future thinking back on this moment, he can think of being there with Henry. And it is, you know, the, um, uh, and Henry's no longer with him. And that's why he goes on this little reverie that I'm missing Henry now because he's thinking about it as a memory. But he's also, I think, um, not learning what he's supposed to learn from this um, experience. Um, that the, uh, that for him, well, he's, or he's questioning it. Does it now only exist in my memory? No, it is not thus your form so divinely wrought and beaming with beauty. So it became, all right, so maybe he does. All right, all right so I'm, I'm, I'm about, I'm going to walk back from that, that, that he does get that. And that is his, that's the final line here is him kind of reiterating what is the end of that poem, um, that, that he doesn't quote here, that, um, uh, the, your form so divinely wrought and beaming with beauty has decayed, but your spirit, still visits and consoles your unhappy friend um, that, hey, Victor's learned a good lesson from a romantic poet, not Percy. So they, uh, anything, do you, any reaction to the poem for you? I'm sorry, I was I mean, plowing that, through. No, I feel like, I feel like you've kind of hit, hit the stuff. Like, no, I, 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 I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> well, my notes had like, he doesn't learn this lesson. And I realized talking about it, that he actually does. And that that is that piece that you read there that, that really brings it home to him. And then it's part in this gush of sorrow. And then it was a clear morning in the days of October when I first saw the white cliffs of Britain. And then we get this light and we saw Tilbury Fort and the Spanish Armada, and, you know, and, and they're like a little, little travelogue at the very, like a little tiny travelogue they're beginning there, you know, sightseeing in England uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the chapter ends. So, um, and, and leading to uh, destruction for Henry that he has hinted at here. So this isn't going to be the, the, you know, the vacation that Henry wanted, nor Victor, right? Well, yeah, I mean, certainly not. And Victor, it's only nominally a vacation as far as Victor's concerned, but going to England, I think to London specifically to, in theory, or 
as it's hinted towards, like meet this philosopher, but ultimately create this being to satisfy the demands of another being. I like the I like the foreboding that it ends on, you know, with seeing London for the first time, the tower. Yeah, a tower and a fort, and you know, so but all righty. Uh, we'll find out what happens next week. Well, Franken readers. Thank you all for tuning in today. We'll post this recording on our website. And if that's how you're watching right now, thank you. Uh, we also have a Sundays with Frankenstein Facebook group where we continue the conversation. It's always a lot of fun on there. So look us up on Facebook and join in that conversation. I'm always available to answer questions via email. Uh, Dr. Anastasia Klinchinskaya will be back next week because I'm surprised I didn't have her on this week too. So, because she's on every week, at least a little bit. So, um, uh, I look forward to having her back on. She is totally wonderful. The first edition of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is just one of the many gems of the Rosenbach's collections. If you're looking for more virtual engagement, head on over to the Rosenbach website. Check out the other virtual offerings we have, including our gallery gateways and exhibitions. And the Rosenbach's also open right now. You can get time tickets for your visit. Just take one party at a time through the museum. We have a new exhibition up on the 19th century Japanese sailor Manjaro, which I'm looking forward to seeing myself one of these days. Um, uh, and I ask you to please support the Rosenbach, which you can do by donation, or if you're not already a member, I invite you to join, especially if you want to join at the basic membership level, the Mary Shelley level. Dan, thanks. Oh, always a pleasure, Ed. Such fun. Totally great. I love having you here. and I really appreciate it. Um, Join us next week, everyone, on Sundays with Frankenstein for chapters two and three of volume three. And we will find out what happens when Victor reconstitutes his workshop of filthy creation. It'll happen again. So uh, once again, everyone, we will be played out by Tucker Christine's pleated gazelle song. It's alive and farewell wandering spirits and remember you have hope and the world before you.